This is the Open University. Hello, my lovelies. Um, I have absolutely no theme, nothing prepared, no ideas even. Um, for, well, it's not quite true. I have some little half-baked ideas for this talk. Uh, it's a Sunday. My partner is away in a forest somewhere up near the Belgian border um, with her sister. And um, so I have this tiny studio apartment in Paris to myself. We've had an amazingly hot weekend. It's been 27 degrees yesterday and it's sunny today. I think it's going to be slightly less than that, but it's kind of crazy for mid-April weather. Um, I've kind of come through my postpartum depression. I also had a bit of seasonal flu, that moment when the weather can't decide whether to be freezing cold or too hot, um, buffets you and, and sort of pushes you into a, a kind of infectious, infected state. So um, I came through a flu and uh, came through the last of the, I hope, the last of the wintry storms and things, the shitty second-hand weather that comes across the channel from Britain. Um, sorry, I'm picking my teeth, but I love picking my teeth in the morning. I also listen to Momus tracks in the morning. That's one of my peculiar habits, listening to my own music in the morning, usually just a track or two. Um, I was listening to a few tracks from Yikes, and uh, I think the first five tracks from Yikes just now, thinking they sounded good. Um, before that, I was listening to the Jesus and Mary Chain's new album, Glasgow Eyes, because <clears throat> somebody on Facebook was saying, they were not a, f a fan of the, the Jesus and Mary chain, but this new album was different and better, and I liked it. Uh, there were good textures and things. You could hear little sort of glam rock influences, Susie Quattro meets Depeche Mode, or so. <laughs> um, but also kind of almost the, the Marilyn Manson thing of screaming in the background and the sort of interestingly tactical discords um, appealed to me. I, I thought some of the arrangements were nice. The trouble is... With bands, I mean, with, with artists that you either like or don't like, it's really a kind of religious or cultural orientation that you can't quite take. So this thing of teenage rebellion and nihilism, which has always been central to the jams, jam sees music, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I, don't, I don't share their religion. That's the, the only real obstacle, the stumbling block. I mean, I have a lot of respect for them as musicians, but also... I kind of think it's this slightly stinky bedroom world of listening to Bob Dylan, The Stones, The Beatles, whatever, the 60s. I'm also very fascinated by the 60s, but not in that purely musical, rock and rolly way that I would write songs about Andrew Luke Oldham. Um, I do get YouTube recommendations for this stuff. Being a bit of a, a boomer, you know, uh, YouTube algorithm knows who I am. Uh, one of the things I was watching on YouTube recently that I was most fascinated by was a film of, um, I wonder if I can show it, I might, there might be rights issues, but a film of somebody driving down the King's Road in 1970. I was really struck by how few jeans, pairs of jeans there were there. Although actually the main place to buy jeans at that time would have been down the King's Road. There was an emporium that sold jeans. Uh, but... Fascinating. I, I found a, a web page that actually list, lists all the shops that were there on the King's Road, including Bazaar, which was Mary Quant's boutique, and um, Granny Takes a Trip, and uh, all the sort of um, classic 60s indie breakthrough boutiques and uh, style emporia. Um, exactly where their positions were, the, the Chelsea uh, drugstore, for instance, which is now a McDonald's, by the time I moved into Chelsea, I spent five years in Chelsea between 1985 and 1990 in a, uh, you know, buying my dinner from the Chelsea kitchen where apparently the Rolling Stones also used to eat um, chicken Kiev and stuff like that. And using a bathroom which had uh, the actual goat's head from the goat's head soup tour of the Rolling Stones lying on the floor there because I lived with a bootlegger who had all this rock and roll memorabilia. It always feels a bit like the... Um, the uh, flat in performance, Nick Rogue's film performance with Mick Jagger again. Um, so we were very conscious in this flat. We were mostly struggling musicians, bootleggers, whatever, conscious that this was a kind of formerly sacred location which had kind of gone to seed. It was a bit run down. The landlord was an old gay man who lived upstairs and just 
you know, picked up boys in the gay pub nearby. But um, it was all chain stores on the King's Road by then. It was Next, mostly branches of Next and Gap and Banana Republic and stuff. And it's even more generic now, even more chain story now. There was at least a, an hour price, you know, on the corner where I would go down into the basement of this hour price on the King's Road and they would start playing closer to you to embarrass me. Um, because they knew who I was and they recognised me when they came in. Um, but this was an 80s, a pale imitation, really, of, of the 60s and 70s Kings Road. The spirit had moved on. I had to Camden or I don't know where else, to the east end of London, um, eventually. Um, but uh, it still had enough, you know, it was a nice place to live. So the albums I produced there, Poison Boyfriend, I mean, they weren't recorded there, they were written in my little, I had a tiny room at the back of Draycott Place, uh, overlooking Bray Place, which is actually in Blow Up, Antonioni's film set around there with Jane Birkin, obviously, and uh, Hemmings playing uh, David Bailey, essentially. So um, watching this film, it really made me realise, you know, how, how boring the King's Road is now. The last time I went, went down there, there was like some chocolate drinks, uh, uh, place where I went in and had an extremely sweet uh, glass of ice cold chocolate. Um, everybody commenting under the 1970 video was saying, wow, everyone was so slim back then. Nobody seemed to be remarking on, well, people saying very well dressed. Inevitably one fascist saying it's because of mass immigration that things have gone down the hill. Absolutely the last reason things in Britain have gone down the hill. Um, the, the main reason being capitalism itself. Although, you know, Mary Quant and people are also capitalism, so we have to distinguish good from bad capitalism. Is it really, you know, I, I often ask this question, uh, pose this question to myself when I look at Japan, where I like, basically I like the, the sort of range of small businesses and, and, and the kind of care and attention that goes into the the Asian capitalism also in South Korea. There's a kind of wonderland of capitalism doing things right there still uh, in a way that it doesn't seem to be able to do in the West anymore. Um, you know, Britain is a sad... sad I, I've watched one channel which is basically just about how high streets in Britain have been hollowed out by greedy rentier landlords and, um, um, you know, shops are boarded up. Uh, nobody can afford rents anymore. Um, and nobody shops in person anymore. <clears throat> so there are all sorts of cultural reasons, I think, why capitalism can be good in some places or relatively non-toxic in some places and completely toxic in others. And they seem to be cultural differences, not really differences which are systematic. Uh, it's not capitalism per se, it's the way, it's the, the adverbial, how you implement something, whether you allow great big cars to truck through the centre of your city, whether you uh, encourage small businesses, whether you have a mixed-use planning system where zones can include lots of different uses. That's sort of absolutely key to the Japanese urban scape is mixed-use planning regulations. Uh, the West has been pathetically monomaniacal about um, saying, well, this is a residential district and this is a, you know, a selling district, a shopping district. Um, I have some not nostalgia exactly, but I have some interest in, in the development of shopping centres. I was looking yesterday at Fairview Shopping Centre, having been brought up for a couple of years in Montreal in the mid-70s. Uh, we had a suburban lifestyle there. It's my main experience of a suburban lifestyle where you're completely car dependent. We lived out in west, west the West Island, near St. Anne de Bellevue, uh, Beaconsfield kind of area. And we had a Volvo estate car, which we'd brought from the UK. Uh, an export model and basically my dad would take the train the commuter train from Beaconsfield station up into central Montreal where he worked in what became Concordia University uh, it was actually at the time Sir George Williams University very nice old kind of brutalist uh, concrete building where I would go occasionally and, and uh, play with the photocopiers and stuff make little magazines and or I'd go for art classes in the magazine at the weekend these were the peaks of my experience there were, were being able to go on the train downtown and be in the center of the city, but it was rare. Few and far between were those trips. And in fact, most of the time I was happy to, my mother was 
had the car and had the, it was an automatic uh, which she could drive and uh, she could uh, take me into Beaconsfield Library, you know, a drive-in library with a big parking lot around it or the shopping centre Fairview, which had been open for about 10 years, I guess, had a large statue of Michelangelo's David, <coughs> which was controversial in itself. Some people complained it was obscene because you could see the genitals on Michelangelo's David. And then it had these... Um, three-level department stores, Eaton's and Simpson's at either end. There was a shop called Cargo Canada, which I was particularly fond of because it had slightly more boutique things, imports, you know, wickerwork furniture and little objet d'art and stuff imported probably from China or from Europe, I don't know. No references to Cargo Canada. Uh, I, I go down these rabbit holes where I'm looking for references to things and often finding them. Um, the most recent one yesterday was... Um, Montreal's the Montreal Star which was a newspaper I actually delivered I had a paper round when I was like 14 delivering newspapers through these mountains of snow uh, on Saturdays the, the Montreal Star would be heavier because it had two magazines actually it had like a supplement like the UK Sunday supplements and then it had a, a listings magazine called the Montreal Scene which had kind of groovy lettering very 60s retro lettering and it had illustrations on the cover commissioned from artists so that was quite enlightened of them I thought um, and then just tv listings and arts listings inside uh, so I kind of had a collector's urge then I, I've always had this kind of slightly could say autistic or something fascination with series of things especially publications so like a particular publisher recently the De Noël um, Edition Littéraire or whatever it's called series from the late 60s or I used to collect even Time magazine or Look and Learn magazine which I found boring in themselves as magazines but once you started getting a sequence of weekly issues it was fascinating again a collection it became a collection and and then there was a play of um, uh, the generic play of difference and similarity. So you get this uh, standard format each week, but then you get variations on the theme. You know, a little bit like making a series of um, of uh, open university videos, which are all different. You know, there's hundreds, there's 250 or something now. They're all different, but they're all the same as well. There's something generic which goes through them, which is my interests. And, but also presentationally, they have a certain ontological... Um, nostalgic uh, feeling to them, um, which is there not for familiarity and reassurance particularly, but uh, also for alienation. This is what fascinates me about looking into the past, is that you, you remember things and you also forget things. Um, and, uh, and then there's a shock of recognition. I mean, the last video, which nobody watched, <laughs> very few people watched, got like 500 views, um, was about this shock of Find, trying to find by scrolling back through my photograph uh, archive at what point the recent past becomes actually the past. So something like a season might change or you might uh, be wearing a different set of clothes um, and that will say, OK, well, that is now definitely feeling like the past, whereas something that happened last week really could be just a, an extension of today. So um, that tug of... The, tug, the sudden strangeness of something uh, fascinates me. And um, I also like alienating other people with reminders of what they were like, what they were doing. I recently had a meet-up with um, Cindy Green, who was one of the dancers in Fisher Spooner, uh, the Electro Clash band from 20 years ago. It all really shocks me that that was all, my New York period was all 20 years ago, you know, uh, or more than 20 years ago. So... Um, Cindy now lives in Paris. Uh, a lot of people from Fisher Spooner moved. They left New York and they moved either back into the Midwest, you know, where they sort of came from. They, a lot of them came from Chicago. They went to the Art Institute of Chicago, then came to New York and made a splash as Fisher Spooner during the Electro Clash years. Uh, but have now kind of drifted to Europe. So I think Casey Spooner lives a lot of the time in Paris, also in Berlin, uh, drifts around Europe anyway. And um, Cindy said she was, she was going to buy an apartment in New York. Uh, and then she thought, what the hell, why? What connections do I have to this city anymore? Uh, and she, came, she, she was coming for other reasons to Paris and just felt so much better here because of the 
beautiful architecture, the city that you can just walk through, and so much variety and beauty and uh, interest packed into Paris. Uh, that's why I'm here as well. I, I do prefer Paris to Berlin. Not really feeling Berlin so much these days because it's so spread out and it doesn't really have the physical beauty of Paris, that sense of a medieval Latin kind of culture that Paris has. And I don't really, I don't get annoyed by it. I know people who've left Paris, uh, like my favourite clothes shop owner, Clara Victoria, left Paris because people on the streets was, were too rude to her, too arrogant and rude and nasty. Um, and she's refurbishing a, a family property she inherited in southern France just now, living in the countryside. How long she'll be able to do that, I don't know, because that's, it's not the most fascinating life for someone who's used to a big city. Um, I think her problem was she bought a car and she had a lot of... There, there is a kind of brutal Hobbesian struggle on the streets when you drive. Um, the competition for parking spaces, just, uh, you know, near accidents happening all the time, people shouting at you, people blaming you, uh, and also just the sheer ugliness of treating everything as a transit corridor, treating a city like Paris as a transit corridor. You're on your way somewhere and you're impatient to get there. You need to just abandon that impatience. I mean, I could do, a, I could do the most scurrilous, coruscating video against car culture uh, you could imagine, because I, I really hate the culture of the imperial, the, the imperial combustion engine, I almost said, the internal combustion engine. It is imperial. It's a kind of awful imperialism. And it's um, an another example of how to, how badly to, to do capitalism, to, to become addicted to something like oil and the whole infrastructure of oil and to be whatever you say and whatever indications are that it's uh, going to destroy your all the best things in your culture, you still cannot kick the addiction to oil. This is what we're seeing just now. We're seeing a lot of politicians completely incapable. You know, the president of France has said, uh, je, no, la France aime la bagnole, moi je l'adore. Uh, France loves its cars. Bagnole is like a familiar term for cars. Um, but me, I adore it. So it's like he's putting himself even more in the pro-car camp distinguishing himself from Mayor Anne Hidalgo, who's um, admirably anti-car. But uh, I actually have an essay coming up on a Swiss website called Wild Papers, uh, I think this month, about an imagined future in which um, someone's looking back saying, uh, we in the 22nd century don't have cars anymore, and we look back at you with pity. And uh, this is the history of how things went terribly wrong and we had to abandon cars. Um, but I was talking about memory, going back to the memory topic. I actually, last night, uh, was watching some documentaries, actually sort of complimentary documentaries. One of them was about a man who could no, not remember more than six seconds in the past, seven seconds, I think, into the past, and who kept saying, this is the first time I'm conscious for decades, you know, and everything's now clear and... Uh, he didn't realise that he was continuously forgetting everything, so he was kind of continuously coming back to life. It was an emotional roller coaster. It absolutely ruined his life. His wife would come in. His wife was the only person he recognised vaguely and knew uh, he was connected to and still loved. Uh, very touching uh, documentary and an awful thing. Uh, the complimentary documentary was about a, a young gay guy in, in Wales who... Um, could remember everything that had ever happened in his life and had uh, instant access, could tell you which day of the week any date was and what he was doing that day. And um, people flummoxed, you know, psychologists, uh, scientists flummoxed by how he did this and saying that he uses a lot of the visual parts of his brain to mem remember things, uh, which most people don't, and that he has instant access and that it's no effort at all for him to, to draw back facts. I'm a little bit like that, in, not in the sense that I can remember things, because I do, thank God, I forget. I think forgetting is essential, and uh, I would be a very depressed person if I couldn't forget some of the awful things I did in my past or that other people did to me in my past. I'm actually a very optimistic person because I'm very good at selectively forgetting, erasing, um, as my song Erase says, uh, erasing the things which have hurt me. Um, but I do have... a a record, and I do go back to that record, uh, like, if I want to remember the 70s, I was writing yesterday to my mother an email, 
talking about this exact date, April 13th, actually yesterday, in 1974, because that's 50 years ago. And it's kind of amazing to me that the, I've reached an age now where I can think back 50 years and I'm kind of semi-adult, I'm 14. We're in Kenny Bunkport, actually, uh, on that date, April 13th, 1974. And my mother is writing the family diary. We had a five-year diary, which I kind of took over later in the 70s, but, uh, uh, and then developed into my own diaries, uh, which I've kept fairly continuously. It's a bit spotty. There are a, a lot of years without written diaries, but I've, in those years, there are other forms of records like videotapes and uh, photographs. At the moment, I'm in a more photography kind of memorization mode. Uh, but um, it's fascinating to me that I can read that we look, We went to the book port in Kennybunk, uh, which reminded my mother of Cambridge and Edinburgh bookshops. Uh, and now I can go on Google and I can look where was that and does it still exist? Actually, it did still exist uh, in that place up until about the turn of the century. And then it went off to a, a strip mall somewhere outside Kennybunk. And all the bookshops in Kennybunk, Port, uh, have closed down it seems since uh, the 70s there were there were three or four independent bookshops there which people would come to the town to visit you know and uh, they've all gone it's kind of part of the unfolding tragedy of America where you, you're, you're trapped in an ever larger car uh, in the 70s people were driving economy cars having tail end collisions in their Ford Pintos and catching fire but dying in the cause of uh, <laughs> fuel economy um, being consumed by the fuel itself. Yeah, um, that's, that's 22 minutes. And it's another weird thing about my brain is I was, if I just improvise, uh, I always end up talking for 22 minutes. Hopefully some of you who have not been watching the last video will be watching this one and finding it interesting because um, I don't want my view figures to plummet. You know, I don't mind it being a thousand or something, but if it plummets below 500, that's time to call it quits on. Open University. After, um, what, seven years or so? It would be a bit sad. Um, it, is, it is another of these tools that I use to look at my past. I do go back kind of almost randomly, often in the bath on my iPad, and watch an old... Open University. From, you know, 2017 or whatever it is. And it really is, it's a radical difference. I suddenly see where I am. I see where I am now, i.e. in the bath with an iPad, which wouldn't have existed in 2017. Uh, well, actually, they had very similar ones, but they weren't so capable. Um, but I get, a, I get a pleasant sense of uh, the multi, multifacetedness, the variety of my own life, because I was in Osaka then, I was, you know, making a different kind of music then. I worry about my current album, Does it, is the arrangement style eccentric enough? You know, is it as interesting as the style back then? Um, that's how you find where you are, is, is looking at where you're not. <laughs> and on that fascinating paradox, I think I'll leave you. Thank you for listening, watching. Open University. a strong theatrical flavour to our desert island discs this evening, as our castaways, the two of them, have built up and look after a huge theatrical collection.